we always ask this question and I mentioned it earlier. What is the most memorable moment when it came to overdoing it, Jules? And the next thing I remember was waking up in a bush covered in chewing gum and it was the morning. And he went out on a Friday night in London and came to on a sun lounger and I beat it on the Sunday. <laughs> I can remember not remembering. Does that make any sense? Went to the toilet in the fridge and stuff like that. You probably didn't do that, Jules. I haven't um, done that either, but I've done plenty <laughs> of silly things. People would say, oh, Nick, you've been really lucky. There's that thing where we arrive in a Lamborghini, we leave in a helicopter, and it's all, Wah! It It wasn't what I thought it was at all. But I'm not gonna sit here and cry about how terrible our lives have been. You know, I, 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 I love my life and I love what I do. Hello, I am Nick Chicane. And I'm Judge Jules. Why are we here, Jules? <laughs> uh, well, we're gonna talk about your After Sunsets uh, series. Um, which predominantly is you talking to other people. Mm. Um, but but actually, you've got a very interesting story, very interesting perspectives on a number of things. Yeah. And you can't really interview yourself. That would be a bit weird. I could have a good go. Um, so we thought we'd get me in as the kind of surrogate, <laughs> the surrogate Nick Chicane yeah, thank to you. ask you a few questions. Thank you for coming down, man. I really appreciate it. Um, so After Sunsets, tell us a bit about it. Uh, After Sunsets is a spin-off um, from Sunsets, which is the podcast radio show I've been doing for a decade. Um, it's kind of chilled and gets going and it's from the beach to the dance floor vibe. And I've been sort of filming it and trying to make it into a kind of a visual thing and uh, hadn't really got it right until now and various things in, in my personal life and everything's kind of slotted into place. So um, that's kind of why we're here today to explain why it is we're doing it, really. A lot of it's about personal experience, isn't it? And I, and I guess... Sometimes as a DJ, you know, you and I have led, led a relatively similar life, mm. um, and it, but it's not a normal life, and it's easy to forget the fact that it's not a normal life at all. Uh, and it's very complex, isn't it? It's the sort of lifestyle that many people aspire towards, but actually the complexities of it, of it <laughs> make it more than just something sort of glamorous going around and playing yeah. tunes and sitting in a studio making records. And I think you've got... The, the, there's much... The, there are many spin-offs of that whole situation, aren't there? Yeah, well, yeah, well there's a backstory to the to the kind of the whole thing. And, and I, I, I like what you said there because it's there's that thing where we arrive in a Lamborghini, we leave in a helicopter, and it's all... You know, and it's far from it, you know. It's, and uh, But I'm not going to sit here and cry about how terrible our lives have been. You know, I, 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 I love my life and I love what I do. But um, I noticed that things were going slightly awry and things were out of balance in my life. I mean, um, I've not been shy in coming forward talking about that. I was a kind of, as a child, I was kind of square peg round hole, dyslexic, didn't didn't fit with things, you know. And uh, I didn't really notice that my behaviour was as, out, out of proportion, but it became obvious later on in life that I, I'm kind of obsessive in every facet in, in my life and, and I from trainers to my cars to my eating to music to the whole thing so when so when I was like I don't know 18 all my mates you know were at college we're all going out and doing naughty things and seeing you know and seeing girls I spent 10 years in the studio on my own I thought it was perfectly fine and things kind of went on from there and uh, and I didn't things just slowly started to catch up with me I think there's a I think there's a backstory to most successful creatives. Whether you're a musician, whether you're a, a DJ, a yeah. performer of any, uh, you know, I've I've definitely got a backstory of sadness to my life. My mother died when I was 18. Wow, wow. Um, I spent 10 years not really able to talk about it, focusing on DJ, yeah, focusing yeah. on music making at that time in particular, focusing on being a promoter of raves. And, you know, that's my personal story. And it's something I find very cathartic and easy to talk about mm. now. Not, It wouldn't have been easy to talk about it at all at the time. It was just I expressed that pain through kind of being a workaholic and being lucky enough to do what I love. Yeah. Um, but clearly, there'll be a similar story to you. And I, I've, you know, when you get behind the front door, by, behind the shop window of a lot of artists who are prepared to talk about it i've th th that those sort of stories are run across our industry yeah. and across the creative sector don't they yeah it's in interesting what you're saying though that we, we're talking about it you know does keep you well and uh, you know and don't you know don't live in your head too much but yeah i mean the behind the scenes thing you know uh 1996 first rec first record i ever did went top 40 went on to having number one records go you know gold albums and all that you know and the behind the scenes thing about that was that uh, people say, oh, I must have been great. And, and, I, and I don't remember enjoying it at all. I remember being absolutely panicked and obsessed about writing the next one. 
and uh, I got thrust in, you know, very much like uh, Tim Bergling, Avicii. I got thrust, I was a studio boff and got thrust into doing shows. Very anxious, you know, had some drinks before I went on stage, uh, got the gig done and had some congratulatory drinks afterwards and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, I, I'm not going to say it was bad. There were some just incredible times. Um, but my life is a little bit different now. Um, I think, uh, you know, when you're 25, you know, I don't know about you, Jules, I was Superman. And even if the 52-year-old version of me visited me back then, I wouldn't have listened. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, when you're in this world, um, I've had many, many mates who've theorised about sort of the nighttime industry, mm -hmm. the, the nocturnal industry, the the kind of culture around clubbing, and 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 some of them have sort of suggested, well, maybe maybe people with a uh, sort of predicated towards addiction and addictive behaviour are almost cluster around an environment where that sort of behaviour is more normalised, and so maybe that's. Do you think that you sort of found you with a slightly let's not say addictive personality because it's so it's dumbing it down a yeah, bit to yeah. describe it as that it's so much more complex than that. But as somebody with your particular personality, do you think you found yourself around music culture, or do you think music culture shaped you into being, you know, it becoming a bit more problematic as time evolved? Uh, I, I went to art college. I was really shy. Alcohol brought me out of myself. And um, I, I felt like I was music culture. I, I, that's all there was to me at that at that point. You know, all I did was eat, sleep, breathe music, and um, I had no social skills. I had no girlfriends really at that time, and. I don't think anybody, any bloke at that age really has. The, the in-between has got it absolutely yeah, right. Yeah. I don't think any bloke at that age actually does have any social skills. It's just you think in your own little kind of world that you have worse social skills than everybody else. <laughs> no, no, I was pretty bad. <laughs> Trust me, I was pretty bad. Uh, and, um, yeah, so, I, you know, um, there was funny stuff, though, you know. So, so, but predominantly we're, we're talking, uh, I, I kind of started to come unstuck a little bit with alcohol and uh but it took a really really long time to manifest itself realistically only about seven or eight years ago you know did it did it really start to i start to have a problem so i was like you was jetting about doing shows i i, I you know i had i'd have quite a lot of drink to do it doing a show feel a bit crap in the morning and off we go again you know, and that set quite a precedent in my head, you know, that everything was fine, you know, but there's lots of funny stuff. Don't get me wrong. You know, I'm not, I don't really want to sit here and preach and tell people, you know, you must never do drugs and must never drink because that's for, for the individual to find out, you know, and there was, there was some hilarious stuff that happened along the way. You know, I've got some stupid, stupid stories, you know, I'm sure like you tried to get into a mirror many times or, you know, um, I can't remember what... I'm too ugly to get into a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd take a, you know, uh, went to the toilet in the fridge and stuff like that. You probably didn't do that, Jules. I haven't um, done that either, but I've done plenty <laughs> of silly things. You know, and yeah. some of it's really funny and some of it's not, <laughs> not so funny. You know, I can remember, I can remember, go, I can remember, I can remember not remembering. Does that make any sense? Um, I was, I was going, I, I knew I was going on a bit of a bender and I hid my car keys. And then the next day I'm thinking, well, where's my car keys? Where's my car keys? And I gave them. Turns out I gave them to my dad, who has Alzheimer's. So I gave my, I can't remember that I gave my keys to my dad, who won't remember giving them to him. So it took some time to find that. Uh, you know, stuff like that, often found talking to the curtains and things like that. You know, some of it's funny, you know, really, really funny, you know. And then some, some things didn't, things weren't so funny. Well, I guess it evolves in, it evolves that way, doesn't it? And I, the interesting thing is, and I, I, I'm, I've I've been surrounded by many people quite close to me who've had alcohol issues in particular. Mm. I'm dare I say it, one of the lucky ones who sort of does have an off button at some point. I wouldn't describe myself as a zero out of ten on the yeah. Kana scale, but I've never been high on the the Kana scale. But you know, in our world, one gets to observe a lot of things, and my my key observation is that the people who are, who don't have um, addiction issues in their lives would view somebody who does as being a 10 out of 10, the sort of person who ends up on a park bench. But of course, it's life isn't like that. For most no. people, 
addiction is a sort of six or a seven out of ten thing, yeah. which afflicts people at some times, but not all the time. But when it does afflict, it has very detrimental consequences on that person personally and very often on the people around them as well. Mm. Yeah, for me, uh, I can only talk about what happened to me, and and it, and it was it was peculiar because. Um, I, I I wasn't like a daily drinker or anything like that. I, I hadn't wrecked my life. I, I wasn't causing carnage, but slowly it, it eroded, you know, and as I got probably, probably about the age 45 plus, things started, to, I would black out sometimes you know I, I wouldn't remember what i did we we have all probably had those nights but they would happen more regularly you know yeah. and things things like that things that would happen and i would have a lot to drink and then i wouldn't drink for four or five weeks uh, and i'd have another then i thought okay I, I, I'll, I'll have a drink um so i could stop so i didn't have a problem if i could stop i didn't have a problem it's interesting those things that you know having drunk for 25 years you know you're trying to sort of convince yourself that things aren't getting a little bit out of balance yeah. you know and um and also i don't know how you feel you know i my head desperately wants me to be 25 still you know we're down with the kids playing the music <laughs> Yeah, it's well, it's that it's that funny conundrum, isn't it? You want the wisdom of our age yeah. with, with the kind of yeah. freedom of being yeah. the wisdom, and dare I say, a bit more money when you're a bit older as yeah. well, with the kind of innocence and the, just the the fun factor yeah. and the bodily strength that you have when you're in your in your twenties. So I went through all that all that kind of thing, and just things started to fall apart, you know. And I I, I, I fought really hard to try and convince myself that. This is this is becoming a problem in in your life, you know. And uh, cut a really long story short, three hab, three re trips to rehab later, which did absolutely nothing because I, I didn't think I had a problem. Um, I just I, I I came to my senses, you know. Um, I completely cut the stuff out. I worked quite heavily with some people in AA, and I I maintain a healthy lifestyle, and that's really what the show's about. It's about, and the reason. It's called it's called after sunsets, obviously, uh, but it's about how my life was and how my life is, and we talk about that, and we have all sorts of guests on, right? So it's not chock full of lunatics and addicts and crazy people. Uh, we've had people like Billy Billingham from the SAS, uh, who does wins program. We've had Steve, uh, Steve, um, not Steve, James Haskell, the rugby player. Interesting, interesting. Both of those characters are really interesting because there's like they've had to retire and and start a new career. Yeah. Both of them. And it's always about how your life was and how your life is. And um, it's fascinating. Uh, I've had some really amazing comedians, Mike Gunn and Harriet Dyer. Wow. Both of them, uh, their stories just, just blow blow your mind that, and but live a healthier life now. And I, I guess this kind of all, it's, it's about accruing wisdom. And I don't remember any time I accrued any wisdom which didn't come through pain, <laughs> really. Yeah, but, but do you know what? The... Um... What I've picked up in life about addictions is that nobody is an addict without deep psychological reason. Um, and addictions, whatever those addictions might be, whether it's drugs, alcohol, or the other part of the panorama of addictions, are just a sticking plaster that are, that are covering up some, some sort of wound. And, you know, personally, I've had, you know, things in my life mm. that have been significant wounds, losing, losing a parent very yeah, young. Yeah. And unless you address those wounds, the sticking plaster element of it will always be required because the wounds don't heal. And that sounds like a really cheap metaphor, no, but no. I actually believe in that very thoroughly. Uh, I found to get well, I had to get honest, really brutally honest with myself. And um, and that's really the key, a, a, a lot of talking to people. Um, but what was prevalent when I immersed myself in other people with issues was that it, it wasn't what I thought it was at all. I came across, this is a generalisation, but I came across lots of independent, successful people uh, who who made a great success of their life, but almost like addiction would have been like a byproduct. And it's really weird. And the only way I can explain that in makes any sense was that people would say, oh, Nick, you've been really lucky. You know, you, you know you've been really lucky. And I, and, I, and I sort of go, I don't remember any luck at all. I can remember having a talent, being bought with a talent, yeah, and then I was relentless, Jules. I yeah. just, I went at it, I went at it and at it again and again and again and again. But that's just one facet. I behaved like that in every area of, of my life, and but I just didn't see it until 
the one thing that caught up with me first was was drinking. It could have been running. It could have been eating. My my, I, I still eat like a lunatic. I mean, I'm about eighteen stone overweight at the minute. You know, um, that's not quite true, but um, it's fascinating. But when I was able to get real and look at it and step out of myself and go, oh, okay, I can see what's going on here. You know, uh, and now I'm able to, you know adjust myself when I, when I'm not where I should be you know I don't drink anymore I haven't drunk for a long time and I haven't had an argument since I stopped which is interesting yeah I mean I don't I've never struck you or you have never struck me as being a particularly argumentative person but maybe I haven't met you on a bender I no don't, know. don't think you have <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh you know it's um I didn't like the person I turned into when I had too much to drink you know um you know, there's there's been a recent there's been a very recent thing in in the news uh, with, with a DJ who uh, appeared on national radio uh, who had had a few few too many to drink, and what's interesting about it and what people don't tend to see, Jules, is that um, we as a society think it's completely okay to have alcohol f floating about, and I'm trying not to preach and sound like blah blah blah. Today released. On the market, alcohol would be a class A narcotic. It's a mind-altering substance. And what I mean by that is, is that if I have a drink, anything could happen after that because it's changed how I think. I loosen up and I'll have different ideas. Oh, it's a good idea. You know, much like the, the, the DJ um, I was talking about um, on national radio, she, given her career a real pounding, she probably wouldn't have done that if she wasn't, you know. Yeah, although I don't, I don't think that, I think... Again, one needs to look behind the, the sticking plaster that, that, that yep. is alcohol because I I can drink and I don't. I mean, for example, I don't have any drink at home. I don't have any alcohol at home. I haven't done for 20 years. Right. That just It just suits me because I'm out yeah, with friends, yeah, yeah. go out a bit with friends. That's my sort of limit. And I, you know, the minute I start having alcohol at home, then I think I need to look in the mirror metaphor and question myself. So we're all we're all a little bit different. Mm. I don't I wouldn't um, I don't you know, have taken drugs when I was younger. I don't particularly want to sort of compare whether alcohol is better or worse. I think I think for the purposes of this conversation, it's more about what that drug means to you and whether you're using it for the right or wrong reason. Because there are plenty of people who just, who are using alcohol or drug or recreational drugs. It sounds a bit odd to say it, but for the right reason, just just for a, yeah. you know, a cheap shot of getting high, really. Yeah, for, um, for sure, for sure. We're, uh, we're not going to condone it and people have to find out for themselves. But what it turned out to be, it has absolutely nothing to do with alcohol. It has nothing yeah. to do with drugs. It just happens to be how my head is. You know, yeah. I did a very interesting uh, uh, podcast this week with uh, of The Gambler, uh, a fantastic guy called Mark Potter. He was a rugby player. He got into gambling. And we we talked to, uh, talked to two days ago about about his addiction, and it was almost identical to mine, in every way. And uh, and it's things that I highlight. Um, it's just how you're wired, and and but it's about absolute. It's about knowing about it and and recognizing it. And that's kind of part and parcel of what the show's about. Um, it really, you know, you know, I don't want to be and <laughs> heavy about it. It's because we, we, very first question we ask on the show is, what were, what were your most memorable moments when it came to overdoing it? And some of them are absolutely hilarious. Yeah, I don't, th I don't think people around me who've who are probably in a similar situation to you, who are who might have indulged more then and probably don't indulge as much now, don't regret every moment of the of the indulgence no, time far nor from do it. I, nor do I. Best, <laughs> they've had some of the best times of their lives. Yeah. But I guess it's part you know, it's part of the growing old process as well, isn't it? You have to respect your body. You have to we, that's the one area where sort of lack of youth is most dispiriting. Am I doing a program yeah. about growing old? Is that yeah. what I'm doing? Well, it's just, you know, your body can't take it. Your body can't take it anymore. I mean, I wake, I don't know about you, but I wake up, you know, if there's one bit, if my ankle or my knee or yeah, my hips no, yeah, aren't, yeah, aren't yeah. hurting when I wake yeah. up in the morning, <laughs> Me too. you know, it's a, it's a good day. And that's just the reality of it all. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. And I think that's what, I think that's what the show is. It's all about how, how I feel now. And I can only say that I, I, my life's incrementally better, you know, uh, and maybe it's about people people watching it and, and relating to it a little bit and, and going, oh, OK, because I, I dare say during the lockdown, there was a whole bunch of people which kind of started to develop problems that that, that I've had and others had from from overindulging, you know? Yeah, it was it was interesting during during COVID, during the pandemic. There seemed to be no middle ground. People either got healthy, drank less. <laughs> yeah. 
or really went completely in the other direction. I don't. I know virtually nobody who did who who sat in the middle and sort of acted like they did before pre-pandemic. Yeah, no, I, I, I've been working with quite a few people who who suffered during during that time. I think we all did. I can remember, uh, Jesus, I can remember in, sitting there in the studio uh, on the studios were on the Isle of Wight, and it was beautiful and sunny. And I'm thinking, this is really weird. People are dying, uh, and um, you know, it was a, such a strange time, you know, because yeah. we we weren't gigging, we weren't doing any of that. What I mean, what were you doing? <laughs> well, I've got my I, I'm, I've got a, I've got a t twin lane life. I'm a DJ. Yeah, yeah. But at the weekend, and I've got a got a specialist music predominantly dance music orientated legal practice during the week yeah and actually that was quite buoyant because many uh, people in the, in the electronic music world who'd been living off the fat of the land from touring suddenly had to turn 90 degrees and think wow i need to make some money from music because it's the only other way i could make some yeah. money so actually there were a lot of deals flowing and i was one of the lucky ones okay. but i mean everybody else i know in dj land really suffered badly yeah yeah but uh, you know so that's kind of what it's all about and um we always ask this question, and I mentioned it earlier. Um, what is the most memorable moment when it came to overdoing it, Jules? Was it was it hilarious? Or did you end up getting locked up or something? Uh, I'd say the well, there's there's one I don't want to talk. This is about, an honest, the, honest. Uh, yeah, there's one I don't want to talk about uh, for an assortment of reasons. I, I'd say I went to the Miami Winter Music Conference, uh -huh. and somebody gave me something. Uh, and the next thing I remember was waking up in a bush covered in chewing gum, and it was the morning Ooh. in in um, in Miami Beach, Florida, and um, obviously had to be metaphorically as well as physically <laughs> return to my hotel room, tail between my legs, and then gingerly call up people I knew. I vaguely remember being <laughs> out with to ask them to ask them whether oh, no. they remembered anything about the night before, in the hope that they didn't recall how I got to be in this bush covered in chewing gum. And suffice to say that my missus rang me from the UK already having heard about it uh, before I'd even sort of engaged with other people. So you were in proper blackout then? Uh, well, uh, well, sort of sunny blackout, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow, well, that you reminded me of, of a good friend of mine, Danny, and uh, his story is, is, is a bit similar to that. And um, he's in our industry. And he went out on a Friday night in London and came to on a sun lounger in Ibiza on the Sunday. <laughs> Doesn't yeah. remember anything in between, and it's kind of funny. But then you think, oh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I my, uh, a very, I won't describe their relationship with me, but they, somebody within the, the industry with me at the time, uh, was at DC Ten, uh -huh. um, in Ibiza. Yeah. Got into a cab, um, sat down, got out the other side, not having gone anywhere, and said, "How much will that be, please?" I like that. <laughs> That's a hundred euros, sir. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, yeah, that, that 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 stuff happens, you know. And I think that's kind of what the show's about, though, Jules. It, you know, it, it, it's funny, and it's it, it, and it's it, it's always funny up until the point when it stops. Yeah, being I mean, funny. the story I've just told you was like twenty five years ago. Exactly, so I was more than capable of dealing with it at the time. Uh, th thankfully, I'd like to think I know my limitations now, as clearly you yeah, do. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, it's, it's just that I was probably having those experiences seven years ago or whatever, wherever it was, you know. And it's like it's quite a big boy to be doing that. Then you know, I had to had to had to address. Had to have a word. Had to have a word. <laughs> so tell us, just I, I guess, as the final question, what what else have you got coming up, and what what are the sort of long term plans? Well, um, as well as the, the after sunset show, um, we're doing a thing called uh, Sunsets Live, uh, and I'm <laughs> I'm hoping the weather stays good. We're having a very British summer, are we not? Worse than British summer, <laughs> yeah. And uh, so every month we go somewhere and we do the radio show live. Uh, we record it. And I'll do. I'll do a mix for a couple of hours. So we we go to places. I went to a, a place called the Wave down in Bristol, which is an inland surf resort. Right. We did the show there. We did a show at a place called Lusty Glaze, which is down in Fistral uh, right. in Newquay. Um, we're doing a skate park in Brighton. We're doing some rooftops in London. So it's really you know, and it's it's kind of epic. It's a lot of drone stuff. It's the show live, basically. I fuck everything up. I mispronounce everything. You know, you would have hated me, uh, you know, to be a co-host when you were on the radio because yeah. I am terrible. I mispronounce everything, but that's kind of the charm of the whole thing. And we do the show live and it goes together as a package. So we have Sunsets as the radio show that's always been going for 10 years. And we have Sunsets Live and After Sunsets. And they're going to be a subscription model. And uh, people can uh, subscribe and uh, hear me talk some complete... Well, what would you call it? 
yeah, it's insight. It's insight. So I think uh, there's nothing uh, more boring than than somebody who is a creative or in the entertainment sphere who just sits behind this veneer of kind of <laughs> dullness. You know, you want to be real. You want to you want to open up. And I think you know if uh, going back to the issue of age and the very small list of advantages that age has one would you'd like to think that one of those advantages advantages being a bit more transparent a bit more self-confident a bit more comfortable within mm. yourself and therefore able to share things and obviously this um and after sunsets is a case in point it really it really really is yeah uh it, it actually kind of keeps me well talking about it and uh i hope people who lose their way slightly or or are struggling can identify with some of the things we talk about you know we don't preach about never to drink again but we we talk about some of the funny things that happen along the way and actually some of the funny things that didn't happen yeah. and how how we live now you know and it's kind of you know a really good life is all about balance and that's key that's key to life and we kind of talk about that and uh hopefully people get something out of it indeed thank you mate it's been a pleasure <laughs> thanks guys